Hi, everyone. Good evening. I would like to welcome you to the Krasno Global Event Series. Thank you very much for your interest and for joining us today for our event on the Quad, Pillar of Stability and Cooperation or Attempt to Contain China. We are looking at the United States, at India, Japan and Australia and their attempt to coordinate their Indo-Pacific policy. As you may know, the Quad is a flexible and informal quadrilateral security dialogue among the four countries I just mentioned. The Quad is based on the tsunami core group through which the four countries coordinated their response to the terrible tsunami of 2004 in the Indian Ocean. Due to unease over China's activities in the South China Sea and Beijing's rising military and economic power, the Quad was revived for a somewhat different purpose in 2006 and 2007, when also joint military exercises were held among the four Quad countries plus Singapore. Then, however, Australia withdrew from the Quad, but Quad cooperation was resumed in the years after 2010, though it soon petered out again. Then, at the November 2017 ASEAN summit in Manila, it was agreed to revive the Quad. More recently, cooperation has intensified. In March of this year, March 2021, there was a virtual summit and a statement was released about the spirit of the Quad. And it expressed a common view about maintaining a free and open Indo-Pacific, but also cooperation in the COVID-19 crisis was agreed upon. In his initial remarks today, Admiral Blair will give us much further details about the history of the Quad, China's strong opposition to it, and whether or not the Quad is a new Southeast Asian NATO, as has been claimed by some. It is a great pleasure to welcome our four special guests today. There is former Director of Intelligence and Commander of the US Pacific Fleet, Admiral Dennis Blair, who joins us today from North Carolina. And here's also Japanese diplomat, Mrs. Natsuko Sakata, who joins us from Harvard University in Cambridge. And Australia's former Foreign Minister, Bob Carr, joins us, joins us from Sydney in Australia, where it is uh, fairly early in the morning. Thank you for joining us at this early hour. And here's also senior fellow and expert on the Quad and India's foreign policy, Dr. Tanvi Madan, who joins us from the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. I'm sure we will all have a most interesting uh, evening. I'm Klaus Lars, and I'm the Richard M. Krasno Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs here at the University of North Carolina in very sunny Chapel Hill. I've been organizing the Krasno Global Event Series since 2012, and we are still going strong. As you know, the Krasno Event Series at UNC always deals with issues of global concern. We have a great website, krasnoevents.com, and a popular YouTube channel, youtube.com slash krasnounc. Tonight, each of our guests will talk for no more than 10 minutes or so, and I will then ask them a few questions before we open it up to questions from you, uh, the audience. As always, please submit your questions by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our excellent two Krasno assistants today, Brianna Weaver and Pete Velasmil, they will select the questions and read them out aloud. As there tend to be so many great questions, unfortunately, not every uh, question can be selected and answered. Please mention your name and your location when writing down a question. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to welcome you tonight to our Krasno event at UNC on the Quad, Pillar of Stability or Vehicle to Contain China. Our first speaker tonight is Admiral Dennis Blair. Admiral Blair served for 34 years in the US Navy and is a former commander in chief of the US Pacific Command, the largest of the combatant commands. He also served on guided missile destroyers in both the Atlantic and the Pacific. He commanded the Kitty Hawk Battle Group. Admiral Blair also served as director of the Joint Staff and he was on the National Security Council. Uh, Admiral Blair has been awarded four Defense Distinguished Service Medals and three National Intelligence Distinguished Service Medals. Perhaps, but perhaps even more important is the fact that Dennis Blair studied a good solid subject as an undergraduate. He earned a degree in history from Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. In 2009 and 2010, Admiral Blair served as President Obama's first Director of National Intelligence. This of course was a formidable job 
probably one of the most difficult and most important uh, jobs in the government. Admiral Blair led the 16 national intelligence agencies, administered a budget of $50 billion, and not least, he had to provide the president with integrated intelligence advice. However, right now, Admiral Blair has an almost equally demanding job. He is a not professor of the practice here at UNC Chapel Hill. Thank you, Dennis, uh, for joining us tonight. And over to you and to the Quad. Please enlighten us. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Klaus. Wonderful to be a part of this uh, distinguished uh, panel. Let me give just a little bit of general background uh, to the uh, development of the Quad before going into uh, giving a little bit of, of the U.S. Uh, perspective on it. Uh, the unlike unlike Europe, it's always been the case that there are a relatively few number of multilateral uh, established organizations in the Asia uh, Indo-Pacific uh, region compared to the alphabet soup of organizations uh, in, in Europe that bring leaders together all the time uh, and uh, to, to talk to one another. There are really just two back before the Quad started. The first one was the US-centered uh, group, the series of relationships, uh, mostly bilateral, uh, that the United States uh, was the center of individual uh, individual defense treaties with Japan, with Republic of Korea, with Australia, uh, with Thailand, uh, with, the, with the Philippines. And the term that was used for this was the hub and spoke uh, relationship with the United States at the center, a bunch of uh, other uh, allies and partners uh, uh, connected to it. Uh, and the United States um, uh, turned that into multilateral meetings sort of at its will, uh, as, as it seemed to be useful, as it didn't, didn't seem to be uh, useful. But uh, there was not a standing multilateral, uh, multilateral forum based on that. The other was uh, the ASEAN-based uh, multilateral uh, system, starting with, starting with the countries now as many as 10, and then the inventive ASEAN diplomats uh, invented uh, things like the ASEAN Plus, ASEAN Regional Forum. Again, a, a number of, um, number of uh, multilateral organizations that would bring different countries who are not part of the core ASEAN organization to meet uh, from time to, uh, time to time to time. So these were the existing two really multinational security structures that Above that, there, the United Nations was really the only place that all of those countries would uh, actually actually meet as members of a common or, organization. Uh, so, the I, I would say that the the real godfather of the Quad was uh, former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe of Japan. Uh, when he came into office the first time back in two thousand seven. He carried in with him a, a, a belief, which he, expect, which he expressed in several speeches, that the uh, democratic uh, free market uh, countries of uh, the Asia Pacific, Indo Pacific region should be getting together and and um, working as a uh, more 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 cooperatively. He gave uh, speeches about that, and uh, and he found a, a ready audience in the George W. Bush administration at the time. Yes. Um, John Howard of uh, of Australia, and at that time Prime Minister Singh of uh, of India, they thought it was a good idea, and th and there there were uh, meet meetings there, uh, and to give a to uh, to make it more than just a just a talk shop, uh, the Malabar exercise, which was a uh, which is an existing uh, bilateral U.S. Indian naval exercise, almost always taking place in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, uh, expanded uh, naval units from Australia and Japan were were in, invited, and there was a there was a four way naval exercise at that at that time. Uh, at this time, the background was that uh, China was in its um, China was in its relatively um, sort of more sweetness than coercion <laughs> phase uh, of advancing it, its uh, interests. In fact, I, re I recall at the time that uh, most of the conversation about China uh, was about uh, the attractiveness of its uh, its diplomats. Wolf diplomacy was far in the future. They, they, the Chinese diplomats were very 
uh, skilled. Uh, the idea was not to present China as a threat, but to work on common uh, objectives. Uh, and, uh, and, and China was really in its, um, in, it was growing economically, but uh, diplomatically and militarily, it, it, was, not, uh, it was not terribly uh, threatening. Uh, nonetheless, China, China uh, strongly reacted to uh, the Quad, which was, uh, and re reacted more to the fact of it than to the things that the, act the Quad actually did and, did and said, presented, presented the marshes to each of the governments, uh, openly uh, denounced it. And, um, and uh, this had an effect and, and that, uh, that uh, almost all of the countries at that time uh, wanted to have good relations with uh, China, feared that China might become more aggressive, more hostile, but uh, preferred to keep it, uh, to try to keep working with it. And uh, when Prime Minister Abe left office and uh, Prime Minister Rudd des decided that uh, he could handle China better on his own and as a member of a member of a, a group, uh, the, the Quad really sort of fell apart and uh, had a had a brief, uh, as, as you mentioned, Klaus, had a, had a brief uh, resuscitation, but uh, was never really that much. During, during the ensuing years, though, there was a, a leftover shadow of it because uh, bilateral and quadrilateral, uh, bilateral and trilateral meetings among those four members took place fairly fairly consistently. And this background idea of uh, the things that these four countries had in common were very much in those conversations, even though not as formally as they had been in, in a quad setting. And now, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, the, the latest instantiation is, has been a revival by the uh, Biden administration. And, uh, and the quad actually met at the uh, head, of state, uh, head of state level, first time, first time big deal um, by Zoom. Uh, and and uh, Issued a um, issued a, uh, a statement about uh, non-military, non-security, uh, or non-traditional security matters and the way that it should uh, it should work together. And that was preceded by the sec the only the second uh, naval exercise of, of the Quad uh, back uh, at the end of end of last uh, end of last year. So uh, the the Quad has been a uh, has has been sort of a, a new form of multilateral. Diplomacy in the in the region, uh, it has been uh, it has been sort of on again, off again, and now here we are in 2021. So let, let me let me give a quick uh, view in my remaining couple of minutes about the, the U.S. Uh, view on it. I would say, from the American point of view, uh, until recently, and we'll see about how it develops now. There's really been less than meets the eye in the uh, quad uh, quad structure. I'd say there was a heavy uh, Element of symbolism rather than rather than substance in quad reactions. Uh, uh, it was sort of a clever diplomatic tool that could be uh, could be used to signal solidarity against China without ever actually mentioning it or without actually uh, coming out with a tough a tough statement, much less tough uh, tough actions. Very flexible, uh, but sort sort of uh, uh, it was in general a good thing that it was probably worth uh, worth. Uh, Worth, worth following, but not pushing too, too hard. Um, you know, modern diplomacy doesn't depend on meetings at certain intervals with diplomats, military officers, heads of state taking long voyages. Uh, we, we, do, we do have modern communications. And so generally the relationships among those four countries were kept up as they needed to be uh, under a lot of normal means of diplomacy and, and communications. And so the, when the Quad came around, it was, um, it was pretty much a symbolic uh, event and it would be tuned in uh, depending on uh, the feelings mostly about China at the, uh, at the moment. I think China's turn to a much more aggressive uh, diplomacy after say 2012 has made a big difference in that uh, the, the four countries feel much more threatened in individual ways and collectively by uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese coercion and, uh, and it uh, has certainly, it certainly has uh, taken on uh, more of a feeling of uh, something that could have substance than it did than it did have. Uh, let me briefly end with the um, with the military uh, section of it uh, from a pro professional point of view. Again, uh, quad meetings that are labeled as sort of quad military exercises, navy exercises are pretty routine, pretty easy to do. Uh, 
based on the Malabar exercise, which was U.S. Uh, U.S. Indian had been for years, uh, the navies uh, operate together under uh, procedures they've worked out primarily in the bilateral setting. U.S. Japan navies are we're the, used to working together all the time. U.S. Australian navies. Uh, so, so those three are are quite well known, known quite familiar with what to do. The Indian Navy uh, basically knows enough about NATO procedures, about working with uh, other countries that they that they fit right right in. And so, the the naval exercises are sort of useful from a tactical point of view, from uh, for all of the ships and planes that take care, care of them. But they don't have a sort of a groundbreaking significance of developing new coordinated. Uh, here's how we could fight together as a, as a coalition kind of an, uh, an approach. So I'd say from sum up from the American point of view, uh, it, <clears throat> as this new instantiation of the Quad uh, is under new conditions, uh, facing a much more aggressive, assertive um, China, both diplomatically with its wolf diplomacy, uh, coercively with its ac actions uh, below the level of uh, military force in the South China China Sea. So China just may succeed in um, in making the Quad a reality, uh, uh, something that uh, had, had not really happened in the 10 year, in the oh, 15 years before. Thank you very much. That's uh, very interesting indeed. Uh, would you say that now it is the United States, which is actually the driving force, the main driving force behind the Quad? Because it used to be Japan, as you outlined, but now it seems to be the US. Or is that wrong? Well, I'd, I'd say certainly it was an American initiative of, of the meetings last month in, uh, yeah. that, that, that took, took place. So the Biden administration, uh, when the new team came on board and they, and, they, uh, and they got together and decided on their agenda, uh, they, they re saw that the, the quad was there, uh, would, be, would be useful. And so they, uh, they suggested it and, and found very uh, ready and willing partners among the, the, th the three other members who had been together at different times over the years. It seemed more appropriate. And uh, so I'd say the, the recent, recently it was an American uh, initiative that got it back together based on originally the Japanese Japanese uh, uh, start. Uh, and even though Prime Minister Abe is gone, um, Prime Minister Suga very much uh, was a partner of uh, Prime Minister Abe for many, many years and, and was willing to uh, do it. And Australia will hear from, will hear from Prime Minister Carr uh, has, had, uh, has been uh, rethinking its defense strategy and in face of a more aggressive uh, China. Uh, India will we'll hear from Dr. Mahdi, but uh, but uh, India has has uh, played this uh, played this uh, organization in in terms of its relations with with uh, China, and it felt that now was a good time. And this is on the basis of Prime Minister Modi establishing a series of good bilateral relationships uh, with Japan with uh, other countries. So I'd say an American initiative, but a, a ready group. I don't think anybody was uh, was dragged reluctantly to the uh, to the altar in this uh, last month. Thank you. But if you put yourself into the shoes of China, you look at the Quad and also the you know increasingly more intensive cooperation as you just outlined, wouldn't you feel ganged up against? Wouldn't you feel threatened? Wouldn't you feel ganged up against? I, yes. I mean, of course, that's what the Chinese say. Um, uh, it, it's hard to underestimate the self-righteousness of Chinese uh, diplomats and public statements when uh, when anybody else uh, anybody else comes to uh, comes together to talk about uh, common objectives. They they say to each other that that uh, that concepts like free and ocean in Indo Indo Pacific uh, democracy universal values, rule-based orders, uh, they, they have convinced them, themselves that these are anti-Chinese. So when there are groups of the other powerful countries in the, in the regions that, that actually have serious armed forces and that, uh, and that have different interests and that use these, these terms that uh, democracies and, and, and free market countries uh, tend to use with each other, the challenge that Chinese regard this as a uh, as, as a challenge and they react instinctively against it as they are now. Yeah, so would you expect that the, um, the Quad can actually shape China's uh, foreign policy behavior or maritime behavior in a more constructive, positive way or will it make them even more obstinate and more difficult to deal with? 
I think they will uh, treat it as a, uh, I think they will treat it as a uh, factor that, that really won't make a difference in their major plan. Their major plan, <clears throat> their major military aggression is taking place in the South China Sea. And it's uh, quite a clever uh, strategy, has various uh, terms, cabbage, cabbage slicing, gray, gray area, uh, sub-conflict and, and so on. It, it, it's using um, the uh, non, more aggressive forms of uh, paramilitary force like fishing fleets, coast guards, uh, administrative diplomacy, and then uh, sends its uh, Navy out to, uh, Navy and its Air Force out to uh, conduct uh, military exercises, but not really to, not really to conquer uh, places. Uh, I'd, I'd say that would uh, continue. And, uh, and uh, the larger calculation that it has made with that uh, approach is that uh, the countries of the region will ac acquiesce to it, uh, and whether the opposition to it is trilateral, bilateral, multilateral, uh, I don't think will make too much difference in, uh, in the Chinese approach. So uh, I think the, uh, the other countries that oppose what China is doing have to, have to do what they have to do, uh, whether it's in a multilateral or a, or a unilateral or a bilateral uh, format. Okay, thanks very much. I've got many more questions, but more later, I would say. Let's uh, turn to our next speaker tonight, and that is Mrs. Natsuko Sakata. Natsuko Sakata is a Japanese diplomat, but tonight, of course, she will speak in a personal capacity, and she will not speak on behalf of the Japanese government. Natsuko was educated both at the University of Tokyo and in the United States, but for some inexplicable reason, Natsuko did not study history. Instead, she received, she received a law degree, first from the University of Tokyo, and then a master's from the School of Law of New York University. She also did a graduate course at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, after which she joined the Japanese Foreign Service in 1995. She was posted overseas in various capacities to France, Malaysia, and Canada. Natsuko has also held many positions within the Japanese Foreign Ministry. Recently, for instance, she was spokesperson for Japanese Foreign Minister Taro Kono. She also was director in charge of Japan's UN peacekeeping operations in Sudan, for example. She also was counselor at the Japan Economic Revitalization Bureau, that is a unit within the Japanese Cabinet Secretariat, which was charged with developing economic growth strategies under Prime Minister Abe. Right now, Natsuko Sakata is on a prestigious secondment to Harvard University. At Harvard, Natsuko is actually the successor to Assistant Minister Noriyuki Shikata, who joined us in person at the Krasno event series in February 2020, just before the pandemic. At Harvard, Natsuko Sakata pursues a most interesting research project. Uh, project. She is working on Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific diplomacy and on the cooperation between Japan and the United States in the post-COVID era. Over to you, Natsuko, and over to the Quad and Japan. Thank you very much, Professor Lars, and especially for inviting me to this event and also to be with distinguished panelists, uh, Admiral Blair, Honorable Carr, Dr. Madden, and wonderful audience from the loop. And special thanks to you for your assistant, Pete and uh, Brenna. Okay, this event will uh, help us not simply to deepen our understanding on the latest nature of Quad, but also to navigate our future coordinated approach on immediate issues to tackle and also for a longer term objective we wish to attain together regionally and globally. So I, well, um, uh, Admiral Blair can really take care of the profound history of Quad. So I jump into the question, uh, what is the latest Quad is all about? And let me make a few remarks from Japanese perspective. In a joint statement of first ever leader level summit of Quad, March 12th, the four countries bring diverse perspectives and strive for Indo-Pacific region that is free, open, inclusive, healthy, anchored by democratic values and unconstrained by coercion. They also strive to go beyond that region. Quad has renewed purpose. So previously it was a 2004 tsunami tragedy response. Under the spirit just I described, the four countries pledged to step up cooperation to tackle the defining, defining challenges of our time. And they laid out working steps to advance on three imminent issues. 
So first, COVID, second, climate change, and third, critical and emerging technology. As a matter of fact, the four countries have already been working on other common areas within and outside the Quad format, such as quality infrastructure, maritime security, counterterrorism, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, human resources development, etc. So main feature of those concerted efforts is to promote and serve for regional or global public goods eventually hope upholding a free, open, prosperous, rule-based in the Pacific that we have endeavored to sustain and develop for decades. And regional issues of, of concern, which are closely relevant to this orientation, were discussed accordingly. Quad coordinated direction of efforts to address issues such as Myanmar, maritime law, and security situations in East and South China Sea and North Korea. So here we turn to the second question, Quad relations with China. Quad has addressed some issues of concern deeply related to China's worrisome policy and provocative practices. Now the envisaged scope of Quad discussion is by nature quite broad, aiming at advancing security and prosperity in, in the Pacific. China is certainly a big piece in this whole picture. We are currently more and more in need to face up with those challenges China poses as to how we advance our free, open, accessible, diverse, and thriving in the Pacific in the 21st century. It needs to shift to accommodating mode built on trust, existing international rules, and fundamental values to be put into practice by regional stakeholders. And China is one of the most counted for. But strategic, envir strategic environment in the, in the Pacific is getting more severe and uncertain. And because of that, what can be a vocal format to send a candid message of our joint aspirations and commitment? I think that counts at least leaving little room for miscalculation on our fundamental stance. And on top of those diplomatic efforts by each of our four countries so far, what can further work as a core engine to invigorate broader momentum? There are now many other like-minded countries and regions pursuing their own initiatives on Indo-Pacific and resonating with this free and open Indo-Pacific vision. I might say FOIP in abbreviation, FOIP vision. For example, ASEAN announced in 2019 the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific. It highlighted that it shares relevant fundamental principles with this FOIP vision and declared further practical cooperation. Since 2018, UK, France, Germany, Netherlands, EU, New Zealand, have launched respective policy guidelines toward the Indo-Pacific and identified prioritized areas of cooperation such as maritime security, quality infrastructure, climate change, and cybersecurity. As such, FOIP vision is becoming a common conceptual framework, rendering more chances to practical, practical coordination. So what we are orchestrating now is bring together our comparative advantage, available assets and diverse perspectives, just as we do for our quad. By connecting ourselves bilaterally, trilaterally or multilaterally, it gives us more chances to articulate and enrich our approaches or, and alternatives. It extends a multi-layer safety net and policy choices for those with readiness to stand up for a free, open, inclusive, and resilient in the Pacific. In this context, let me quickly touch upon another need to upgrade existing principles and fill the gaps in our system, current system, such as new rulemaking on digital trade, for example, or the WTO reform as such. We need to be candid in translating deficiencies into evolution and resilience. So let's uh, wrap up. So what is an eye-catching, robust format? And security side tends to draw larger attention. 
we have to be very much prepared to constant strains, strains and frictions as we proceed with this poet, free and open in the Pacific vision, especially when every country encounters with insecurities and uncertainties at the time of historical crisis. Still, if a longer term orientation is widely shared, the mission of Quad or a broader partnership will fit to our time to put together our worldwide efforts and aspirations to make a foreseeable and sustainable future with advanced fundamental values. I stop here. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much indeed. It's uh, most illuminating. But uh, let me ask you, what do we actually mean by free and open Indo-Pacific? Isn't just that just a phrase which sounds nice and doesn't mean very much, or does it have a deeper meaning? Of course, um, we, you know, we, if we talk about some initiative, we try to be very much brief. We cannot uh, make a long, long statement that, uh, so we put many uh, meanings in that. that uh, so sometimes we have to be very careful what we are uh, sharing uh, Fair enough, on the basis. What is the, yeah. meaning? What is the meaning? Well, um, free is, you know, typically, um, uh, democratic values and freedom, like uh, or free market, uh, yeah, free market or that kinds of what we have enjoyed broadly, especially after World War II. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So normally in those uh, literatures of international relations, we see you know the American hegemony uh, led that kind of values to to expand uh, all over the world. So, but okay, thank you. If you say uh, one should put more substance into uh, the quad, what does that mean in practice? How can one do that? So, um, it, uh, how the, would the, you the, it is, do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, with the quad, uh, that's a very much a driving force, a great engine. Uh, we have you know those, those major powers in this region, and we have that capacity, willingness, and assets. So as I described, uh, for this, um, the latest quad has illustrated out three major, uh, the concrete ste steps to go. These are the major issues. Uh, I said defining uh, uh, challenges of our time. So we first of all work on that, but uh, as also I also mentioned that there are still other um, concrete uh, cooperation, uh, it's, uh, which is uh, already underway, like maritime security, like such as the um, Coast Guard training in the Southeast Asian countries. Uh, mostly the, we, we're doing a lot, uh, US, Australia as well. Uh, India has a very much um, uh, capacity of uh, conducting this um, uh, Coast Guard enforcement activities. So this uh, huge capacity and also the infrastructure, quality infrastructure building uh, in, in the Pacific region to raise connectivity and so on. So there are so, already so many, you know, this kind of building blocks. And this time we, Quite highlighted what we really imminently uh, work to do. These are the three okay. working groups. So yeah. these are the working groups. We have to uh, detail on the uh, the TOR right now, and um, uh, the, those three working group will work on that. And towards the end of this year, the, there will be another uh, in-person summit meeting. So definitely, we the bureaucrats have to work on to make a follow-up to bring out a real deliverables. Sure, thank you. And uh, because of the strong opposition of China to the Quad, Japan will not get cold feet in the future and become less committed to the Quad? What is your expectation? Uh, well, uh, as uh, Admiral Blair Kandri mentioned, uh, that we uh, somehow uh, in more than 10 years ago started up, up with this uh, Quad. Yep. It's um, Mr. Prime Minister Abe, uh, Describe this is the uh, Asian uh, democratic security diamond to somehow uh, encroaching China. But this is right. kind of too much a symbolic uh, phrase to say. But um, uh, you see, uh, what I'm going to say? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, at the first year, uh, as this is also uh, Adam uh, kind of mentioned that, well, had a backlash vis-a-vis -vis China, but still we are upholding this, um, the, the real values and the, the principles that we have nurtured for such a long time uh, after the World War II. And uh, these values, what we 
pretty, pretty much highlighted, nurtured, but with so many countries, regions, uh, th this kind of stance have always, what we have uh, shared with China, what is also, what are, are we driving for? And, uh, and of course, China is one of the very much um, a huge piece that would drive the um, Indo-Pacific uh, prosperity and stability aspect as well. So that's why how we can uh, align ourselves to, uh, to achieve uh, mutual stability and prosperity, uh, not just on us, but also uh, the region. That, that's where we really have to uh, make utmost effort to, to coordinate with each other and et cetera. That is, and, um, and also with, in face of those um, stepping up aggressiveness, well, partly because of the China's domestic situation, oh, they are heading for the you know 100 uh, uh, years anniversary of establishing the Communist Party this year. Next year, they are having the um, another big uh, party assembly uh, once in five years. So this the mood is more like a power struggles, and this uh, domestic you know the the situation political situation was rather putting the um, those um, uh, the, the 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 speed and course to mm -hmm. this aggressiveness. So we have to bear with it. So th that's what I just mentioned at the last uh, remark that we have to bear with these, you know, frictions on and off. And but eventually, we always try to be clear where we are heading for for the long term vision. And uh, we believe that China can, of course, uh, live with it because they they had had before, uh, like uh, Deng Xiaoping's, you know, the uh, orientation of open up and. Uh, Thank you. That, that's kind of thing. So yeah. we, we have to continue and bear with uh, the, this. Um, I hope this will be the temporary that we might have to bear with the rather longer frictions and those and face us with this aggressiveness okay. and how we yeah uh, coordinate and uh, bringing together those various perspectives to thank you very much. It. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Let's turn to our next speaker. That is um, the Honourable Bob Carr. Bob Carr is a former foreign minister of Australia. He also was a senator in the federal parliament and the longstanding premier of New South Wales and leader of the Labour Party. In fact, Bob is the longest premier of New South Wales from 1995 to 2005. And during his time as premier, in particular, he emphasized conservation and the protection of the environment. And Bob Carr and his team also did much of the planning for the successful Sydney Olympics in 2000. And like Admiral Blair, Bob Carr also studied a very solid subject as an undergraduate. He received a degree in history from the University of New South Wales. As Minister of Foreign Affairs from 2012 to 2013, Bob focused on successfully getting Australia onto the UN Security Council. He also worked on the passage of a global arms treaty on the Middle East peace process and the war in Syria. Last not, le not least, Bob Carr worked on improving Australia's complex relations with Asia, not least with China, but also with Myanmar, for example. Regarding China, Bob viewed China's leaders as being determined, confident, and pragmatic, but he also still supported Australia's decision to block Huawei technologies from participating in the Australian national broadband uh, network. Bob has written a great and entertaining memoir about his time as foreign minister, The Diary of a Foreign Minister. I can warmly recommend it. Thank you, Bob, for joining us again today. Over to you and to the court. Yeah, well, Klaus, good morning from um, a sunny but autumn Sydney. I'm looking out my window. There are some, uh, some Australian parrots, the very colourful red, green, yellow, black, that have landed on the... Uh, the telegraph wires, the, uh, the telephone wires. And I'm glad you like history. Um, uh, Admiral Blair might be interested that I'm looking at the bookshelf in front of me um, over on the left-hand side, and I can see I can see books he'd be familiar with. Um, Freeman's three-volume account, two-volume account of Southern Command in the Civil War, and his two-volume biography of General Lee and the three volumes of Shelby Foote's History of the Civil War, I'm proud to say autographed by the author. So I, 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 I'm thrilled to be speaking to a group that takes, takes history seriously. Um, for Australia, the, uh, the, the development of the Quad in recent months 
has been something that's very welcome. Um, it's achieved a fundamental multi-decade Australian goal of sharpening the American commitment to the region to Australia's north. Um, and that's so basic in Australian strategic thinking. Um, it, it doesn't need dwelling on. In addition, we welcome the fact that it has nations talking about the Indo-Pacific, as Ms. Sakata just has from Japanese perspective. Um, we like that term and it's easily understood. Australia is, has a presence in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Island. Um, and, and Australia's found itself after years of trying, now admitted to the Malabar naval exercises, India having overcome its earlier reluctance to see Australia participate, probably because of India's careful management of its relationship with China. The standout fact for me about the strengthening of the Quad is one, the shift in the Indian position, and two, the response it represents to a more confident, assertive, here one gropes for the right adjective, but I would say party directed Chinese diplomacy. So let me touch on that first. Um, a colleague of mine, Kevin Rudd, a former Prime Minister of Australia, now with the Asia Society in New York, wrote in 2018 an analysis of what had been settled at the Foreign Policy Work Conference of the Chinese leadership that had just been concluded in June that year, June 22 to 28, 2018, the Chinese Communist Party concluding its central conference on work relating to foreign affairs, the second since Xi Jinping had become General Secretary of the Party and Chairman of the Central Military Commission in 2012. And Reading this report, indeed, as I flew up to a conference in Beijing that, that Klaus, you attended, the peace conference hosted by uh, Xinhua University, I read the report and I was a bit sceptical, especially, and the scepticism was confirmed after I spoke to Chinese academics at that conference, because Kevin Rudd's paper suggested that after a period of, of greater assertiveness, Chinese foreign policy would become even more assertive post-June 2018. Um, he had said it'd be wise to expect um, more party influence and more, more of a party character in the behaviour of Chinese diplomats. He said, he said um, there will be more of the Xi factor. Um, there'll be more, conf more confidence that history favours China in Chinese foreign policy. Um, he said there's nothing random about what's unfolding in the world today. This is a Chinese view. Second, that the, the developments in the world reflect certain immutable laws of political and economic development. And third, the business of Chinese foreign policy is to use this dialect of prism to understand precisely what's happening in the world. It goes on <clears throat> um, and dwells a little on how China was tending, based on this material, to, to see its diplomats as party cadres. Um, he said, taken together, expect more assertiveness in Chinese foreign, foreign policy post June 2018, rather than a more cautious approach. And the Chinese academics I spoke to at the conference had a different view. They said the view at and around the conference was, was that China had, had lost, especially in Europe, um, from becoming more assertive. It was inviting um, more pushback from the United States, and one should expect more caution from China. In fact, <clears throat> uh, Kevin Rudd's analysis has been correct from mid 2018. If you look at if you look at Hong Kong, and if you look at China's behaviour on the border with India you have in fact seen a still more assertive China. And Beijing would have to absorb the lesson that this has produced a shift in the behavior of India, which is the 
indispensable starting point for what we're looking at in the recent development of the Quad. I remember before the blow up on the border, the Sino-Indian border, hearing a report that Indian diplomats had spoken positively about how India was enjoying a sweet spot. India was the most desired girl on the block. It was being courted by America, deepening its partnership with India, um, a successful thrust in American foreign policy going back to the administration of George W. Bush. Uh, yet at the same time, it had a, a, a deepening relationship with China with enormous economic benefits, and it seemed a good understanding between um, President Xi and, and Prime Minister Modi. India was in a sweet spot. China would have to think long and hard about how its forceful behaviour on the border with India, I'm not seeking to analyse the, the historically very complex relations along that border uh, and criticize, even criticise the behaviour of either side, but China, there's no evidence that China even considered pulling back from conflict. As a result, India has shifted its diplomatic position. Um, India, which had reservations about the Quad because it represented a big statement in terms of its relationship with China, has signed up for more explicit Quad activities. And surely this can be understood as International Relations 101. Assertiveness from a rising power produces uh, a response the building of a coalition by those who feel threatened uh, if the rising power expresses itself through, through assertiveness. Um, there are limitations, clear limitations, on, on the promise of the Quad. You face ASEAN and its attachment to ASEAN centrality, um, and ASEAN saying it has a different view, its own view of the Indo-Pacific from that presented by um, the Quad powers. Um, You've got a big question mark, can the Quad impose costs on China in response to assertive Chinese foreign policy? And I think you've got the biggest challenge of all, which is the, the continued economic growth of China. Uh, people endlessly point out that China is not the old Soviet Union. And if we are headed to a new Cold War, it will be with a power with a massively innovative an adaptive economy with the leads in many of the cutting edge sectors, like uh, many categories of artificial intelligence and robotics, for example. Um, to the powers of Southeast Asia, to other powers in Asia, uh, China is there just over the horizon. Uh, there is a question that another former Australian Prime Minister, Paul Keating, often puts, is a non-Asian power capable of dominating, capable of having a veto role in Asia, um, given, he implies, the continuing economic development of China. But still, you have enormous potential in the Quad, and China would be deeply mistaken if it overlooked what the recent summit of uh, national leaders of the four Quad powers represented. It is a response to Chinese assertiveness. Will it change China's behavior? There are other forces identifiable in that, that working, working uh, conference of mid-2018 still going to dominate China's international personality? We seem to be left with what one Australian academic provocatively puts as this question, um, China won't conform to the US vision that Quad powers also subscribe to of US-led rules-based order prevailing in Asia. China would seem to be determined to restore its position as a great power, equal to any, and as this academic puts it, subordinate to none. The, the long-term question for the US is whether the Biden administration or the American people understand the scale of the costs and risks involved in this. I mentioned the, um, the book I've got on US history, the US Civil War, but my iPad is propped 
on top of another book on another, another theme. It's called The Sleepwalkers. It's an account of the descent into World War I, the sleepwalkers, what happened in the breakdown of the world order, the European order, in July and August 1914. Um, we've all got to be concerned about the prospect of conflict. Um, most likely, I would hazard over, over, over the relations of the US and China in, in Taiwan Strait, in the Taiwan Strait. Um, and one big question here is whether the US would be tempted to stretch the quad into a statement by other powers, perhaps including Europeans, on Taiwan. I think that's, there, are, there, there are hints that American diplomacy is attracted to that concept. Um, Richard Hass's view that uh, America needs to end strategic ambiguity on Taiwan might be one pointer to that. But I hope, I hope that in the creative thinking that Kurt Campbell um, is, is directing in his role in the State Department, that there is a focus on the off-ramps that can protect both sides from that, that vast unknown, a war in the Pacific between China and the United States. Um, what would victory over China look like? What would be the character of such a war? Uh, this is a terrible, a terrible thought, but one we must, we must test. And uh, to conclude, I think the primary challenge here is for China's, China's foreign policy. Um, Lee Kuan Yew used to challenge us by asking us to think about the character of China in the world. And I remember one of the one of Lee Kuan, Kuan Yew's observations uh, brought together by Graham Allison in that book, collecting all the thoughts of Lee Kuan Yew about China, was this. The character of the world is going to be determined in the future by the nature of China's behaviour. Um, and that has never been a more relevant consideration at any time than this. And if old Lee Kuan Yew was still with us, he'd be entitled to claim vindication. That comment rings more true and challengingly today than it did uh, 15 years ago when he made it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, let me ask you about Australia and the Quad. In the past, Australia blew kind of cold and hot about the Quad, you know, was committed and then kind of withdrew. Uh, is that likely to happen again, or do you think Australia is going to be substantially committed to upholding or even strengthening the Quad? Yeah, I think the latter committed uh, indeed to strengthening it. Um, Australia has tilted against China very decisively in 2017. Um, I would be a critic of the lack of diplomacy involved in this. For example, while I support what the government did on Huawei, and indeed the government I was part of had made a decision to exclude Huawei from supplying equipment to the development of our national broadband network. I thought there were infinitely better words that could have accompanied the announcement. Australia should have simply said we're excluding Huawei because of considerations of security and resilience of our national communication system and left it at that. Instead, we turned it into a demonstration of our loyalty to the US and put it in the context of a discussion between our Prime Minister and President Trump. And we then gave the impression that our security agencies were holding this up as a, a model for other countries. Instead of just making the decision, a decision that was certainly going to be very harmful to an iconic Chinese company and leaving it at that. A second quick example of what I thought has been inept inept uh, choice of words in Australian diplomacy in respect of our relationship with China was talking about the inquiry of the origins and early management of the COVID pandemic. We're entitled to do this. I think China's got to take responsibility for the, what happened at its so-called wet markets um, and for its failure to clamp down after SARS on the trade in wild animal meats. But the way Australia went about sponsoring the inquiry made it look like we were doing it at the bequest of the Trump administration as an anti-China gesture. 
Um, we spoke about sending weapon-style inspectors into Wuhan. Now, that's not the language of diplomacy, and um, I'm critical of the Australian government for that. But nonetheless, the bottom line is that Australia, all shades of opinion in Australia, um, have apprehension about recent Chinese behaviour, uh, Xinjiang um, policy towards the Uyghurs and Hong Kong, for example. And in that context, um, the Quad has support. And I think there'd be support for a strengthening of the Quad, as I said at the outset. Um, there might, however, be a reluctance to see some extension of Quad thinking in respect of Taiwan Strait, where Australia historically has had some strategic ambiguity, um, although strategic ambiguity that might be in the process of being um, um, shed, um, Thank you. given what's happening on that front. Yeah, thank you. You're breaking up slightly, but let me ask you one more question. Um, I mean, it is pretty obvious that China would see the Quad and similar things as a vehicle to gang up on China. So anyone would, I guess. Um, so shouldn't there also be an instrument which brings in China rather than ganging up or excluding China, but also trying to cooperate with China, which of course will be very difficult and challenging, no question about it, but shouldn't the attempt be made or not? I think, I think if I were foreign minister and I was having a, uh, I were having an off the record conversation with foreign minister Wang Yi, I, I, I'd speak strongly first by saying the evolution of the Quad is a response to Chinese behavior on the border with India. It is a response. Um, and um, the future development of the Quad will very largely be determined by the behavior um, Wang Yi of, of the nation you represent. Nonetheless, we are absolutely committed to collaboration with China on the great challenges of climate and pandemic management and a diplomatic agenda that includes other things like um, uh, a, uh, a, a successful revival of a, an Iranian path that excludes nuclearization, on which China has played a constructive role. You cannot contemplate a world where China is excluded. And I think any impression that the Quad is about old fashioned containment of China is bad because it cannot be delivered. Now the nations of Southeast Asia, the 10 nations in ASEAN um, would not subscribe to such a, no a notion because China is the power the growing economy just over the right. Thank you very much indeed. Let's come to our fourth speaker tonight, and that is Dr. Tanvi Madan. Tanvi is Senior Fellow and Director of the India Project at the Brookings Think Tank in Washington, DC. Tanvi's work ex explores India's role in the world and its foreign policy, focusing in particular on India's relations with China and the United States. She also researches the intersection between Indian energy policies and its foreign and security policies. Uh, Tanvi is the author of the very well-received book, Fateful Triangle, how China shaped US-India relations during the Cold War. And that came out with Brookings Press in 2020. And right now she's completing a monograph on India's foreign policy diversification strategy. And she's also researching the China-India-US triangle. In her previous life, Tanvi Madan was a Harrington Doctoral Fellow and Teaching Assistant at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin, and she also worked in the information technology industry in India. Tanvi frequently cooperates with the international media. And I'm happy to say, like Dennis Blair and Bob Carr, Tanvi is also a, a student of history. She received a BA with honors in history from Lady Sri Ram College in New Delhi in India. She also got a master's in international relations from Yale and a PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. Thank you for joining us tonight, Tanvi. It uh, is a pleasure to listen to you and the Quad and India. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Lars, to you and your team. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be on this panel 
uh, with uh, a very distinguished set of panelists, uh, the majority of whom uh, I did not know are historians, and that's always uh, wonderful. Um, you asked me to speak a little bit about India's relations with China and the Quad, um, and so I'll do that one after the other. And in many ways, um, uh, as has already been alluded to, those two are connected. Um, over the last year, two of the trends that have been visible in India's approach to the Indo-Pacific more broadly are one, intensification of competition with China, and second, uh, the reinforcing or accelerating of India's like-minded partnerships through various platforms, uh, including the Australia and Japan US Quad. Um, these two trends, as I said, are connected. Um, let me first address take a few minutes to talk about that competition uh, with China that India has and the intensification of it. Um, while there have been and are cooperative elements in the India-China relationship, uh, there are far more areas of competition. And this, this last year has also shown uh, that the potentially conflictual aspects of that relationship can actually turn uh, into conflict. Um, the ongoing China-India boundary crisis, it's the worst since the 1960s when they fought a war. Uh, this is uh, about the one year mark uh, of that uh, boundary crisis and it continues. As far as Delhi is concerned, its view of the conflict is uh, that since early May 2020, uh, the PLA unilaterally changed the status quo through the use of force, either by hindering patrols or Indian patrols or establishing a permanent presence in territory that both sides claim, and in some cases across what India sees as the line of actual control that separates the two militaries. Uh, this is the fourth boundary crisis uh, since Xi Jinping has come to power after uh, a, a couple of decades, uh, two and a half decades of relative calm at the border. There were boundary crises in 2013, 2014, 2017, uh, and the current one. The 2017 one uh, was influential in India, changing India's mind about reviving the Quad and I'll come back uh, to that. Uh, the current crisis is different from these previous crises, even the, the three that have uh, preceded it uh, since Xi Jinping has come to power. Uh, the scale of the deployments are larger. The level of aggressiveness witnessed is higher. It's taking place at multiple locations rather than just one, uh, which was what uh, the previous crises involved and has resulted in the first fatalities in 45 years at the India-China border. Uh, it's also resulted in the first shots fired at the China-India border in decades. Um, more consequentially, uh, for perhaps kind of the broader relationship, and this comes back to the question is, what happens if, uh, if China and India agree uh, or achieve some sort of stability at the border? Uh, consequentially, India sees China as having not just uh, uh, kind of undergone what it sees as salami slicing tactics uh, at, in the Himalayas, but it sees China as having violated agreements between Delhi and Beijing on maintaining peace and tranquility at the boundary, which India holds is what made broader China engagement, India engagement possible, including economic ties that they were developing. Um, Delhi has made it clear that as long as peace is disturbed at the border, it will have an adverse impact on the broader China-India relationship. Beijing, on the other hand, has said that the boundary issue should be kept separate from the broader relationship, or as Wang Yi said, to be put in its proper place. Uh, the current situation is that military and diplomatic talks have resulted in, resulted in an agreement to disengage, though not de-escalate, uh, at one contested location out of the multiple, uh, and further disengagement talks are on for additional locations. Um, this will, at the if, if all these get resolved, it won't solve the border issue, but it can help stabilize the boundary situation. Uh, regardless of what happens in that case, there have already been serious consequences uh, in India. Uh, the boundary crisis has done damage to perceptions of China in the Indian public, in the strategic community, uh, and within government where it is hardened view, views. Among the uh, Quad countries, if you think about it, uh, in China, India is the only one that has actually seen China consistently as a challenge since the 1950s, late 1950s. Um, it, and it has planned, uh, its, its uh, uh, war planners have been planning a four war against China, as well as potentially a two front war with China and Pakistan. But what Indian policymakers thought is they had time to deal with this challenge. Uh, what this current moment has brought to the fore for them is that they do not have extended periods of time, uh, that the challenge uh, is, if, if not quite imminent, at least important and is not going to go anywhere, uh, away anytime soon. 
There's been policy impact as well. Uh, the crisis together with uh, China's COVID related uh, approach have reinforced and in some cases accelerated India existing Indian concerns about China, including about economic overdependence on and exposure to China, the inroads of Chinese companies and made in sensitive sector and Chinese avenues of influence in India. And so while you might have heard about India's ban on Chinese apps, uh, these intensifying Indian concerns have led to a broader slew of measures uh, measures that will restrict or increase scrutiny of Chinese activities in a number of domains in India, including uh, economic technology, telecommunications, public diplomacy, and education. Now, beyond the boundary, there are a number of areas of strain between India and China, bilateral, regional, and even global, which mean that even if this boundary situation is stabilized, the competition will continue. The broader problem for India is that while it believes it is essential to compete with and deter China at the boundary, in the region, and particularly its neighborhood, as well as in international institution, institutions, it is constrained in terms of its own resources and bandwidth uh, because, because of existing capabilities gap between India and China, uh, because of the COVID crisis, but also because of the economic fallout from that. And these constraints have strengthened the Indian need to work with partners. And that brings me to that kind of second trend that I talked about, uh, which is the like-minded partnerships that India is deepening. Uh, the US is perhaps most crucial for India in terms of maintaining a favorable balance of power in the region. Uh, but there is uncertainty in India about US willingness and ability given its own need to tackle COVID, economic recovery and political pol polarization. And in general, India prefers not to put it all its eggs in one basket. Uh, there are also some questions about continued U the U.S. Uh, uh, stance on China and if that would continue. And I think the, uh, India is now convinced that the Biden administration is taking a competitive approach. But regardless, because of uncertainties, also what might happen in 2024 in the next election here, you do see India continue to diversify its partnerships, deepening ties with various democratic partners like Japan and Australia, but also France, Britain, South Korea and the European Union, as well as it continues to maintain a partnership with Russia, though it is concerned about Sino-Russian relations. It's deepening these ties through various platforms. And this is where the Quad fits in. For India, the Quad is one of those platforms. It's now engaging in various ways and at different levels. Um, there is a ra broader rationale to this grouping and Admiral Blair laid it out and I'll just add to this. I think that the, the four countries see it as a uh, collaborative initiative uh, for the four of them that have similar though not identical visions of the Indo-Pacific. They perceive China in particular as challenging uh, the rules-based order. They see existing mechanisms, whether that's the hub and spoke model of alliances, whether that's ASEAN, or whether that's multilateral institutions as insufficient to tackle the challenge. And they found it necessary to work with each other. Now, why these four countries? Um, the countries possess the military and economic means to shape the balance of power in the region, to offer alternatives, and potentially to affect China's calculations. Their collective strengths are considerable. Military reach, overseas financing capabilities, maritime power, research and innovation capabilities, natural resources, large markets, and systems of transparency and accountability. Um, and this makes them a coalition of the capable. But it also makes, there's also an aspect of this where they're a coalition of the willing and capable, where the willing part is that they are willing uh, to stick their necks up, even if that upsets China. Having said that, this group is, has said, and uh, I think seeks to convey, and particularly India does, that the group is not about containing China, but shaping its behavior. It's not about dictating choices of other countries in the region, but expanding them. And it's not about regional, being a regional policeman, but strengthening resilience in the region so others can better defend themselves as well. And so the broader message has been that it's not the, the, that the Quad is not to bring instability in uh, the region as China contends, but to bring solutions to the region. And this is why this vaccine initiative that Sakata San mentioned uh, was kind of the first big initiative that they rolled out. Uh, and this is kind of reflective also broadly of the kind of mechanism, kind of an interest-based coalition uh, that is likely to become much more commonplace in the years ahead. Let me just uh, take a couple of minutes to talk about a few different aspects of kind of why India has changed its mind and Minister Carl mentioned some of them. 
Um, India, as I said, does not see the Quad as the only platform, but it sees it as a crucial one. It had been reluctant about uh, reviving the Quad in the past, um, but it has uh, taken kind of the process of developing the Quad step by step. Well, why was it reluctant? Uh, I think a few different things. One, there was uncertainty or concern about uh, A, Quad partners, uh, China approaches, would they be consistent? Second, other partners' reactions. How would Russia see this? How would ASEAN see this? And third, there was uncertainty about and concern about China's reaction. Would cooperation with China, uh, with the Quad, provoke Beijing into more assertiveness against India? Over the last year, India has moved past this reluctance, but I think this it goes back to 2017 after the previous boundary crisis uh, between uh, China and India at the Bhutan-China-India tri-junction. It was after that crisis, which lasted for 73 days, that India agreed to uh, a request to revive uh, the quadrilateral. But in the last year, uh, this agreement to kind of upgrade the quad has been facilitated in, and you've seen different things that India has agreed to with the quad to include Australia in the Malabar exercise, as was mentioned, uh, to uh, 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 elevate the quad to the ministerial and then the leaders summit. And what was important about India's agreement to hold both a ministerial meeting in February and the upgrade to the leaders level, it, it, it was came at a time, a sensitive time in India-China disengagement talks. And the fact that it agreed to this, uh, this uh, upgrading, uh, even if it upset Beijing, is a sign of India saying, we will not let China veto our participation in the Quad anymore. So what changed in this last year? I think increasing Chinese assertiveness since 2017 in particular, as everybody mentioned. I think India has also noticed that all other Quad partners continue to have a competitive view of China and it has held for now. Um, they've also found Quad consultations useful over the last few years. Um, there's also greater habits of cooperation. Uh, and these shouldn't be between the four countries and this shouldn't be underestimated through bilaterals and trilaterals in particular. And those continue to be important as Admiral Blair pointed out. Um, India, like I think Australia, has understood also that the Quad is one way of keeping other partners, particularly the US, but all of them committed uh, to this kind of vision of the region and tackling the China challenge. And it's seen it as a useful platform to shape their views and explain India's perceptive, uh, perceptions in various issues. Um, two other things that have been crucial. I think the greater comfort level with Australia in particular of the bilaterals. Uh, the bilateral cooperation between Australia and India over the last few years in defense, security, technology has grown considerably. It has transformed from the previous uh, relationship that the countries had, and it's facilitated India's willingness to do these things with the Quad. And then finally, political will. You have senior in officials in India who believe in this concept uh, and in the challenge that they're trying to tackle. And so you see India ready to cooperate through the Quad. Uh, to bring together kind of this free, open and inclusive, just briefly, what does India mean by free, open and in inclusive? Uh, free as in kind of uh, democracies, but also free as in countries in the region being free to make choices and not have choices imposed on them. Open in terms of freedom of navigation and overflight, but open also in terms of systems of transparency and accountability. And then inclusive, both to send a message to countries in Southeast Asia or partners like South Asia that they or South Korea that they are not that this is not cooperation excluding them, uh, but it does involve bringing them in together through various means with the Quad in bilaterals in trilaterals. It is also a message to China that if it actually subscribes to the rules based order in the region. It is very, it can also be part of a free and open Indo-Pacific, but that requires it to stick to uh, the rules. Um, I will just end by saying there are some challenges uh, that we can talk about uh, from the Indian perspective, but I think more broadly uh, from uh, all the countries' perspectives, um, I will convey one thing. I think it is important to understand that this is not a silver bullet. It will not achieve everything. And while there's a lot of uh, cooperation that we've seen over the last uh, year and couple of years in the Quad, um, there are also, for example, the Quad countries, either two of them cooperating with a third country or in different formats, uh, they are actually working with other like-minded partners. I'll just give you two examples. One was the Quad Plus uh, discussions. There were regular weekly phone calls at the Deputy Secretary of State level uh, to discuss uh, COVID-19 uh, response and recovery. 
these included the Quad plus New Zealand, South Korea, and Vietnam. Uh, and then you had some Quad military exercises with other like-minded. There's one ongoing right now with uh, the Quad in France in the Bay of Bengal. And there was one uh, a, a couple of months ago with the Quad and anti-submarine warfare exercise with the Quad in Canada. Um, and you are also seeing them work together in various international institutions as well. Um, so I'll end with that. I, I will say that there, there is an expectation amongst the poor countries part uh, that China will try to pursue a wedge strategy between them uh, and cause kind of dissension uh, within uh, between quad, uh, quad countries. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. This was very illuminating indeed. Um, so that talk about uh, Southeast Asian NATO, that Quad will develop into something like that. Is that total nonsense or would you say there is some, some validity to that? So I think this idea of uh, an Asian NATO, um, this was a label that uh, Beijing put on it. Wang Yi was uh, in October. I mean, it's, it goes back uh, to the first iteration of the Quad, but Wang Yi uh, mentioned it publicly again in Malaysia, and that was deliberate uh, in October, uh, back in October when there was a, a ministerial meeting uh, of the Quad. Um, yesterday, the Indian External Affairs Minister was asked about this. He was uh, at an Australia, India, France trilateral panel. And he said, look, this is mind games on the part of, he didn't mention China, they never named China publicly, but they say, he said, this is mind games on the part of certain countries that want this, want to scare countries uh, to about what this is. And that we will not let others define what it is. And we will not let others define who we will partner with. Uh, this is not going to be an alliance. I don't think anybody expects it to be an alliance. If anything, it is a reflection uh, that while alliance is important, and after all, Australia and Japan are allies, that they are with, need, there's a need to bring in, kind of in various coalitions, and the Quad is only going to be one, you have technology coalitions being talked about, whether that's the D10 that uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has proposed uh, to talk about 5G and AI, um, as well as a number of others, there, there are conversations about coalitions on supply chain resilience. This is going to be one, uh, and it's not going to be an alliance. I think it's going to remain flexible. Uh, but I think there will be greater, for example, on the maritime security side, just greater interoperability, uh, greater willingness to work with each other. Uh, these military, merit, these navies are now constantly exercising, but also their exercises are becoming more complex. They are bringing in Southeast Asian countries. There was a US, India, Japan group sale. Uh, with the Philippines through the South China Sea uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, there's, uh, there's kind of a, a multilateral exercise that's taking place next month uh, that will bring in additional countries. So um, I don't think it's going to be an alliance. Uh, and I, I, I think, you know, um, uh, it exists because I think in Asian, from a histor historian's perspective, um, there was an attempt to have an Asian NATO. It was uh, CETO. It didn't work. Even the Russians, the Soviets tried uh, to bring together, they had a collective security mechanism that didn't work either. And so I think it's partly a recognition that this doesn't work in Asia. And so Thank instead you. of uh, hub and spoke, you're seeing a network, a spider web of alliances and partnerships. But how realistic is it really that uh, uh, something like Quad or Quad Plus can shape China's behavior? Will it not lead to the opposite, a more intransigent attitude by the Chinese? No, I, 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 I'm on this kind of this question of kind of the, the ganging up on China thing where Admiral Blair is. My, the way I put it is if Beijing is upset about the quad and wants to know why it happened, it just needs to look in the mirror. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, it, it has, uh, as Minister Gar said, it's a natural response. It is, you know, balance of power or kind of uh, international relations 101. Um, and, and so, you know, the, it is, I think, a challenge. How do you deter China and particularly I think this is one of the challenges for the Quad. Um, in some ways, you know, India, for example, has it, it, it always reacts the same way when there are these border incidents. Uh, it goes and kind of sits put and then it doesn't budge. And so the next point is, you know, how do you deter China from doing this again? And so deterrence is a, it, and it's sometimes easier to do it in kind of the broader sense. I think deterrence is harder when it comes to these kind of gray zone operations. And I think that's a challenge for the Quad. I think the idea is to shape China's calculations in different ways, which is one to actually try, uh, there's always gonna be a collective, uh, collective action problem, but if you can have like-minded countries, not just these countries, but European ones as well, stick to the rules and say, we are going to defend them, including things like freedom of navigation, 
then it's harder for China to do these things. If you help build resilience, political, economic, geopolitical of the countries in the region, then they themselves will have a better ability uh, to make things harder for China. And I don't mean this in a defense way, but for example, you have better, you help countries develop better investment screening ability. This will make it easier for them to make sure uh, that the contracts they're signing, that the investments that they're coming in uh, are more transparent uh, and uh, better. So I think it is, will it succeed in shaping China? I think China is, as, as Mr. Kass, they are going to do, but it, 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 sh it sure shouldn't be uh, on the other countries of the region to make it easy for them mm -hmm. uh, to, to deserve the kind of neighborhood. I think the goal is, to, and, and from India's perspective, the goal is to ensure that there isn't a unipolar Asia. And it has realized that this kind of grouping can help ensure multipolarity in Asia. Um, and I think there was a mention of kind of, you know, the, the U.S. is the external actor as, uh, as uh, uh, China has held. Uh, India has made it a point to talk about, and Prime Minister Modi did at the Quad meeting, he said this is the region that is a home to all four countries, indicating that as far as he's concerned, the U.S. is an Indo-Pacific country. It's not an outsider. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, final uh, brief question to you before we have to open it to questions from mm -hmm. the audience. Um, is India also trying to exploit the situation now that in Washington, of course, there's an overwhelming anti-China consensus? Is China, uh, is India trying to move into that vacuum, perhaps, and perhaps become uh, uh, America's most favorite Asian partner, and also in terms of trade relations, improve, you know, the intensity of U.S.-Indian trade relations? I think they realize that the, you know, al al allies matter. And so, you know, Japan and Australia and even South Korea in various ways will take precedence. And that means something, those kind of secured the, the, the treaty allies, that, that is a difference. So I don't think it's about becoming the most favored nation, but I think it is useful for India um, that multiple administrations since um, uh, 2000, this goes back um, two decades, and it goes back to both Democratic and, and Republican administrations uh, that have seen India as a geopolitical balance, a economic alternative, and a democratic contrast um, to China. Um, and yes, it is useful for India. It, it, uh, you know, it brings India benefits. It means that it has got access now to capabilities that the U.S. was unwilling um, to, to uh, uh, sell it. It, it, has become, it has meant that the U.S. has uh, propounded uh, India's case uh, for larger leadership role in the in, in the world. Uh, but it's also meant that both countries make it a point to manage those differences that they have, and they do have them, um, including on trade, which is, uh, you know, one area where I think of the quad countries, the US and India uh, need to actually do more, uh, where Australia and Japan have taken the lead is on the trade uh, front, where I think both India and the US are going through a bit of a phase of reshoring and onshoring uh, to, to when they're thinking about resilience rather than uh, diversification uh, to, to build resilience. So I think some of the protectionist instincts in both the US and India right now are going to prevent uh, some of that, but there, there is supposed to be a mini trade deal that's been in the works for the last two years. We'll see what happens with that. Okay, thank you very much. We have to come to questions from the audience. Brianna, are you there? Would you like to ask the uh, first question, please? You're, you're muted. Can you please unmute yourself? Sorry about that. Yeah, Mike Flynn from Raleigh, North Carolina asks, what is the position of the Quad regarding China's actions in the South China Sea, particularly with respect to the militarization of the man-made islands in the Spratlys? Maybe we should ask Admiral Blair here. Well, the, the Quad has not addressed that directly, but it's relatively easy to deduce an answer if you believe in the, in the rule-based free and open principles, then what China has done is wrong, uh, unacceptable. And, uh, and that's, that's pretty clear. And I don't, I don't, if the quad were to make a statement on that, it would be, it'd be quite a change of character of, of the purpose of the, of the quad. So I, I don't think it's a, um, I don't think it's something that's likely in the quad, uh, point of view. I think the, I think, and I think the, the sorts of sort of cooperative counter demonstrations that we've seen of freedom of navigation exercises, uh, multilateral military exercises in the region, assistance to coast guards of 
of the other claimant countries, the Philippines, Vietnam, and so on, are the sorts of practical uh, signs that you see, and they're being taken by virtually all of the Quad members individually. Uh, and um, I don't think it would make much difference either positive or negative if, if they had some sort of quad imprimatur on them, I think they really are, are taken uh, uh, as, they, as they happen. Thank you. Would anyone else like to come in? Or shall we go on? I'll just like to say that there has been some discussion about, for example, uh, quad countries, or you know, not just with each other, but with others involved as well, coordinating, for example, some of their uh, capacity building efforts and security assistance. So uh, there's not too much redundancy built in, and they're actually, uh, um, you know, conserving resources while still um, getting the job done. The joint statement this time did mention uh, activities of concern uh, in kind of the east and south China um, seas and. Uh, on Japanese requests, because I can imagine the others didn't necessarily did express concern even about China's Coast Guard um, uh, Coast Guard law. Okay, thank you, I, Klaus. Just one other point. I yeah. I think it, I think it's worth mentioning, saying that um, the Quad does not have a secretariat. It has no organizational structure separate from the standard ministries of foreign affairs and defenses and so on of the of the country. So, uh, if you it, it it really doesn't take take actions as a body the way the way organizations that have secretariats whether they be ASEAN or whether they be NATO or whether they be mm -hmm. whether they be trade organizations so um, you know the, the the quad is basically just uh, meetings plus actions carried out by individual individual governments uh, I think it would be a major step to watch for if the quad were to develop a quadrilateral uh, secretariat uh, with the secretary general actually physically placed in some point uh, taking responsibility for uh, planning uh, carrying out overseeing uh, actions uh, diplomats military officers uh, economists uh, would you expect that no I don't, I don't i only if china does something really outrageous uh, which uh, i keep coming back to this point that the only the only country that can 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 China is China, <laughs> and uh, they 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 take quite a few actions that uh, that uh, you know get the rest of us to uh, reach out and say uh, maybe we better uh, maybe we better think about uh, uh, cooperating on 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 this. And um, I, I I think it, any developments in the Quad uh, in a more coordinated, formalized, permanently staffed uh, structure would all be uh, because of. Uh, more, more aggressive Chinese actions. Thank you. Pete, would you like to ask the next question? Absolutely. We have a question for Bob Carr from Alan Vo. In light of intense US political partisanship, how confident are Australians in a consistent US commitment to the Quad? I think, I think if there's one area where partisanship is not tearing American leadership pulling American leadership in different directions, it is on attitude towards China. There you've got a consensus. Um, it's a fairly hawkish consensus too. Um, and Ameri both sides of American politics would be committed, appear to be committed um, quite strongly to what we've been calling in this discussion, a more competitive relationship with China. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Brianna. Yes, this is a question for uh, Natsuko Sakata. So in your opinion, how do international relations experts in Japan view China as an emerging great power capable of peaceful cooperation or um, as a country intent on imposing its will on South and on East and Southeast Asian countries? Yeah, thank you for the question. So I just uh, quickly mentioned a uh, right while before, um, uh, in uh, just a um, few years ago, we uh, compared to now, we rather have more candid, uh, more better relations with China. And um, we really had a very candid talk. Uh, we raised uh, the, the East China Sea uh, situation, South China Sea situation, um, as the, the joint statement this time uh, elaborates. Uh, uh, we worry some about, the, uh, we expressed the concerns about China's uh, behavior in those maritime areas in terms of you know, the maritime law. 
whole. So um, this kind of uh, frictions are there, but still we had some ways of um, or generating trust, uh, trustful relations to hold this candid relationship to uh, navigate our, you know, the Chinese behavior to more, you know, accommodative uh, way with um, external uh, relations. Uh, at this moment, uh, I see more and more, uh, I see more and more difficulties as I also mentioned that uh, because of the China's internal politics, they are more much geared to you know the power concentration, and they cannot never, especially the leadership cannot express somewhat uh, a show somewhat um, uh, making compromising stance towards uh, U.S. or Japan or anybody else. Uh, so. Uh, but still, in the end, they have to realize that what well, China cannot just uh, impose their own values or their orders into outer world. Uh, we somehow share uh, the baselines of um, uh, code of conduct. And that's why we have to continue to step up our voices to say uh, no or it shouldn't or that, that kind of efforts we have to uh, continue, even though uh, we are now at a very much um, uh, difficult phase. And um, coming back to the first question addressed to uh, 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 Dr. Madden and um, Admiral Blair, that um, the Admiral Blair mentioned that the phone operation, for example, that kind of hard asset usage might be a good um, effective demonstration of our enforcing the maritime law. And also I might add that ASEAN should also speak up. Although I cannot encourage them to use their hard power, hard assets, although they have this uh, capability building uh, assisted by US or India or us or the Australia, it's still uh, the capability uh, will be very much fragile in face of China China's, you know, aggressive power projection, but still they can speak up uh, for several years. They have talking about the code of conduct vis-a-vis -vis China. So this kind of efforts should also be uh, take on, also also take take on to somehow behave China in various ways. So that's why Quad and other broader partnership can bring in perspectives and the different and uh, comparative advantages or ideas into it. How we can, you know, in the end, in the end, shape this inclusive, better, harmonious uh, circumstances together. So thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Can I just bring in a question by a student of mine, by Jordan Lenz, who asked, has the Quad actually already discussed climate change and the effect on climate change on global security and Quad security? Bob, that's a question for you. Yeah, no, no, it hasn't. And this feeds, this feeds my frustration um, with discussions about international relations and security. Um, climate is a major security issue. As a former US president uh, was fond of saying, um, climate change, global warming, is nature's weapon of mass destruction. Um, uh, Admiral Blair could certainly point to um, fundamentally challenging work produced by the Pentagon on the security impl implications of climate change, but by and large, I think uh, the world international relations community has been woefully slow to talk about climate and relate it to security concerns. I remember a conference in the Middle East in the, the UAE five years ago. Um, there was a panel talking about the, uh, the um, uh, fragile, fragile statehood across um, North Africa. Um, about the civil war in Syria. And I asked the, the panel a question, are you aware of any work that relates um, state vulnerability to shifting climate patterns, um, producing refugee flows and all the rest? Um, are you aware that a savage drought preceded civil unrest in Syria that led to civil war and the drought was exceptional enough to be considered a symptom of, of climate. And there was no response from the panel at all. I think the challenge we all face is to consider more deeply the hugely dis disruptive effect of, of, of climate change. And I can't think of any region um, 
that is going to be, that faces more potential dislocation with international relations implications than um, those nations, preeminently India and China, that are so reliant on glacier and monsoon fed rivers off the Himalayas. Thank you. Uh, Brianna, would you ask another question? Um, is it reasonable to assume that China would like to supplant the US dollar with its own currency as the world's reserve currency? And what steps uh, must China do for that to happen? Is anyone qualified to answer that, uh, Tanvi? <laughs> I'm not qualified. My colleague Ishwar Prasad has written an entire book on this. Uh, I would recommend that. But I do. I would say, you know, we have seen efforts uh, through BRI for um, um, for kind of uh, China to 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 get other countries to use the renminbi. But there there is kind of a basic challenge for China, which is if you're going to internationalize it you have to have a level of transparency um, that they have not been willing to provide. And so I think that potentially will limit things. I will say though, that there is a broader issue here uh, where even countries like India have this concern that if the US, there is a sense amongst a number of countries about the US overuse of sanctions and countries. And so even kind of partner countries who suddenly have to think about whether it was Japan or India having to suddenly say, okay, we can't, import oil from Iran, uh, not just because of our relationship with the US, but because uh, it, all the banking is, all the payments are in dollars. Um, you know, it, it, it constrains their ability to make decisions. And as far as China and Russia are concerned, the, the concern has been, you know, how do you reduce your vulnerability uh, to pressure eventually? And so there has been talk of alternate means. And so whether that is internationalizing the air maybe, but now you even hear talk about all these digital currencies of which I am not an expert, but you, you have heard these conversations about reducing vulnerability and exposure to potential pressure points. And this is not just by the way, uh, China and Russia, I've heard it uh, in, in partner countries as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Pete. Yes, we have a question for Dr. Madan and uh, Ms. Sakata. What do you think are the prospects of an expanded multilateral group in Asia between South Korea or other countries? And we'll start with Ms. Akar. Yeah, we just discussed about, you know, the what about other, you know, the partners vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Quad. And uh, I believe that Quad is, uh, and also the Secretary of Things. And I think that the Quad is uh, still kind of uh, informal feature. Uh, the, but the absence of uh, secretaries is not, you know, uh, hindering our efforts, our coordination efforts, and uh, it's bringing about bringing about deliverables. Uh, we're doing utmost efforts. This is because of the this close uh, relationship, so uh, the historical close relationship so far, the diplomatic efforts and well, military terms and etc., economic terms etc. So we really benefit from this uh, long-standing uh, close relations with each other, trilaterally, multilaterally, and laterally so and uh, so uh, and I do not see any move to make it institutionalized or making secretary yet so we'll probably will go on so uh, quad already decided to meet together that leaders meet together within uh, this year so maybe we, we still keep momentum, probably uh, in response to China's uh, ongoing aggressive behavior as a mirror image of, of this. Anyway, and expanded growth, well, at this moment, so uh, some of us already mentioned that even we have this squad re-mobilized, but still we value uh, this um, uh, strengthening broader partnership. So quad plus one, for example, the maritime exercise with France recently, or that, that's kind of things. And you, uh, this questioner uh, pick, picked up uh, South Korea. For example, South Korea has a very much difficult uh, position vis-a-vis -vis Quad. They cannot uh, obviously uh, join and cannot be, uh, announce uh, they, their willingness because of, you know, they are very much um, uh, sensitive relationship with China. So there are that kind of, you know, sensitivities around uh, due to the, the vulnerability or the, the, the diplomatic principles they have. So uh, we're not pushing them to join us or uh, we're not, of course, excluding anybody. Uh, it's the approach, whole approach we're taking is inclusive, uh, open. So 
we might this squad can initiate some you know the for example we um, launched uh, three working groups each has their own space uh, pace to to go on and of course uh, some countries might be interested in join and then this could you know make the quad can be a core but it, it can expand we have no reason to exclude uh, other partners so in that way we can work this quad format very much flexible but the ultimate goal is how we can broaden uh, the, uh, the this cooperative network broader and make uh, the prosperity stability safety net uh, as you know the broader as possible so that everyone can enjoy benefit from that thank you okay thank you very much Tanvi. Um, so, you know, I, I agree with everything Sakata-san said. Um, I'll just add, uh, initially, when um, that, that Shinzo Abe wrote the, in 2012 the Democratic Security Diamond article, uh, it, he actually mentioned uh, eventually bringing in the UK and France. Um, I don't think the Quad will be expanded. I think, that, and I don't think it should be expanded, the Quad per se. Uh, it has reached a certain comfort level. It has a shared convergence in China that other potential partners don't. Um, and so it would it would not be, and this wasn't a problem the Quad had, by the way, till two months ago. It used to be the skunk at the garden party. Nobody wanted to know it. Now people are actually interested in joining the club, at least the UK is. So I think what you'll see is kind of this plug and play of different uh, combinations of countries doing uh, some of these similar activities. So for example, Australia and India have multiple trilaterals with Indonesia, with France, um, and and um, you, you see them kind of doing things in that space. So the Australia, India, France one, they're focused on maritime security, including uh, dealing with IUU fishing issues and th those kind of things. So I think it's not going to be about expanding the quad. It's going to be about working with these others. I do think there are ways also to make sure these other partners know what the quad is doing. Um, so with South Korea, for example, uh, before and after, just before and after the quad uh, leader summit, uh, you saw very, uh, Marie Spain, the Australian foreign minister, she touched base with, she, she spoke to her Korean counterpart. Uh, you saw uh, India host the South Korean defense minister uh, just, uh, uh, just after that. And you saw uh, Secretary Blinken um, go, uh, as well as Secretary Austin, go to um, South Korea as well and discuss the Indo-Pacific there. And so you, you do see kind of different ways. I will just say that one, um, since uh, Sakal san mentioned the working group, um, as Mr. Carl said, the Quad didn't use to talk about climate change because this was not something the Trump administration uh, wanted to talk about. Uh, but the, one of the new working groups is on climate change. Uh, and so we'll see that where that goes. The countries have differences on this. Um, the US is more forward leaning, or at least the Biden administration is. Australia and India, meantime, having discussions about India buying Australian coal while Japan is considering, you know, st stopping financing coal uh, projects. But I do think everybody is committed um, to kind of things like renewable energy. India has one of the most ambitious programs in the world. Uh, but so there are differences on it, but they are also starting to talk about it in the quad moment. Great, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Bob, just, just quickly add, um, when I spoke about climate earlier, I should have acknowledged the, the galvanizing effect of leadership by the Biden administration. Uh, from an Australian perspective, um, in, indeed from a global perspective, the leadership of America that America is now offering on climate is exemplary. It's going, to, it's going to force Australia to do far more than it's done. At the present time, we're the only developed country not to make a commitment to net zero emissions by 2050. And we're going to be isolated next week, April 22nd, of the leaders a summit being hosted by President Biden, um, because we're a long way, of, a long way short of being ready to announce what America is going to announce, what Britain will announce, and that is stepped up medium term goals. Japan too, having last year made a commitment to net zero emissions by 2050, is going to make that announcement, confirm that announcement about no funding of coal fired development. What I'm looking forward to here uh, Tanvi is, is what I think would be exhilarating, and that is competition between China and India um, on climate. And I think, I think India is on the, on the brink of, of being able to provide quite inspiring leadership given its capacity for renewables. 
uh, linked to its own desire to, to achieve energy self-sufficiency. And as Prime Minister Modi is deeply aware, um, what gives you most self-sufficiency is renewable power. Okay, thank you very much. Let me just ask a question by one of our loyal supporters, that is Brian Kielet. He says, uh, every one of our distinguished uh, panelists seem to expect or seem to think that conflict with China is inevitable. Can they not see a way for us all to live harmoni harmoniously together? Atsuko. How can we live harmoniously together with China? That's been a long would, historical actually, conflict with China. I'm not China. expecting a huge conflict with China. I hope not. But uh, for example, the in the East China Sea, um, well, uh, more than 60 days in row, Chinese uh, coast guard are intruding into the, the uh, uh, territory water of Senkaku Island. So we're seeing that. And they, you know that we are, of course, deploying our Coast Guard uh, vessels and to, 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 to demonstrate our own, um, you know, the, the capacity of um, uh, law enforcement. And of course, we see each other. We are, you know, send a message just to go away from our uh, territory waters, and etc. So that kind of, you know, uh, relatively a uh, humble uh, projection of hard power, a hard asset. But anyway, uh, this is the way we uh, cope with uh, that kind of, you know, aggressive frictions with China. So there are some ways of doing that. And but, uh, we have to do that. Uh, try uh, not to escalate the situation, but still, this is what we can uh, probably do at most at, at, uh, under these current circumstances to uh, push back their aggressiveness, but uh, not too much, uh, you know, uh, escalating the situation or harming the bilateral. But still, we are showing by every means that uh, this is the rules that we commonly uh, to be to to honor honor together. So, so you wouldn't expect a major great power conflict by between the United States and China, for example. Well, that that phrase, <laughs> well, uh, last uh, since last autumn I came here uh, to Cambridge, everyone's talking about the the reality of you know the U.S.-China conflict, especially over Taiwan. And Taiwan is so close to Senkaku, and we have a U.S. bases in Okinawa. Okinawa is so close to you know Senkaku and uh, the Taiwan as well. So uh, it is somewhat a uh, kind of a um, uh, reality of our, you know, uh, sort of facing uh, this uh, very much uh, conflict, possibly conflict face as a part of our own uh, issue. So, uh, so in that sense, we are very much uh, sensing this um, very much um, the fever of this um, uh, the U.S. China conflict, and uh, but we are you know at this moment uh, doing utmost effort to you know push back with each other, and um, but not to uh, make a deteriorating situation. But we still see we see for this this phase for the moment, and um, okay. so uh, you are you are moderately optimistic. Moderately optimistic. Uh, at least we are showing we are not, you know, uh, instigating uh, the, the conflict. I understand. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. Let me let me go on to Tanvi. What is your view? I don't think conflict is inevitable since we're all historians here, or many of us are. Um, I don't believe in kind of inevitability. Um, I think, you know, choices matter. So I don't think conflict is inevitable, but I think con competition is a reality. I mean, the easy answer to you know, how can you ensure everybody lives harmoniously is that um, either we all in, you know, or in the Indo-Pacific accept uh, China's rules or uh, everybody sticks to the existing rules that exist now. And when China says it didn't have anything to do with setting them, that's wrong. It was part of the UNCLOS process, for example. Um, so I think, you know, that's easy. But I, I think in, since, since that seems to be a tough uh, slog for everybody, um, I think this is why something Michelle Flournoy wrote in the Financial Times last year, uh, it is important for the countries to reestablish deterrence uh, and to, 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 to convey to China that it will have, uh, um, that there will be kind of consequences that it shouldn't take, that they, you know, these, these decisions will not, or these choices will have uh, an impact. Um, I think in the China-India case, you see this in India, essentially, um, uh, holding the whole relation, saying the whole the whole relationship is contingent on that border boundary issue being solved, um, and and or at least not solved but stabilized. And so it it 
has meant it, it will do, it will hurt India too economically. Uh, but they've said that, look, these things are important because if you do this today, how can we trust any agreement you sign on anything else? Um, and so I think deterrence is important uh, to reestablish in the region. And at the same time, to make sure that they are channels of communications co with Beijing uh, that ensure that these, when these competitive or even potentially conflictual dynamics play out, that they don't escalate into, into, um, into conflict. Thank you, Bob, what do you think? Yeah, here's a great challenge for American and Chinese diplomacy, and that is to dial back the tension that's been building over Taiwan. And given the experience both sides have had of dealing with Taiwan Strait issues, that should not be impossible. Um, no one knows this more intimately than Kurt Campbell, appointed by the president to uh, oversight American diplomacy in the region. Um, the Chinese, even though they've, they've behaved um, in puzzling ways, if I put it uh, most diplomatically, in Hong Kong and on the Sino-Indian border um, in the last uh, 18 months or so, must surely understand that the risks are too high in continuing, as both sides have been, on Taiwan. Um, from the, from the non-Chinese perspective, we've got to ask ourselves, um, without giving ground to China, without compromising any of our values or interests, what does, the hard question, what does victory over China mean? What does it mean? Are we talking about, are we talking about occupation of part of China? Well, in the week that America's wound down its longest war, the most uh, challenging of the forever wars in, Af in Afghanistan, um, that's an acute question to ask. Um, how quickly a conflict between the US and China could descend into a nuclear, nuclear exchange is not hard to imagine, but we're dealing with an adversary that now could inflict nuclear damage on American cities, destroy Los Angeles, for example. That's a chilling thing even to enunciate, but it's something we've got to face. I think all of us in this panel would be agreed that it would be, it would be most desirable to see more of Deng Xiao Ping's spirit, bide your time, hide your strength, reintroduced into the Chinese foreign policy that we've witnessed since June 2018, and in fact, earlier since 2012. But that is unlikely. China is not, as Anchorage confirmed, is not ready to say, no, we'll accept American leadership in the region. Hence the need for the most careful diplomacy again, I've got my iPad propped on, on top of a book uh, that deals with the breakdown of the world order in July, August, 1914. And I hope we're all conscious of how mistakes can lead to the unthinkable. And we've got to be bold enough and brave enough to imagine uh, competition without catastrophe. To take the words of uh, an article in, article in Foreign Affairs six months ago by Kurt Campbell, which offers us hope that both sides can pull back from uh, uh, that catastrophe that, as historians, uh, we're aware, can often result from uh, the sort of tensions we're analysing today. Thank you very much. We are well out of time. If our uh, panellists agree, I will ask each of our assistants uh, to ask one final question before we then uh, conclude it. Would that be okay? Then uh, perhaps, Brianna, why don't you ask the final question from the list of questions we still have? Okay, um, Paul Ayer from the Center for the National Interest asked, to what extent is the Quad constrained by the varying threat perceptions among its members, levels of confidence they have in each other and levels of comfort with identifying China as its target? I, I can answer that. Um, uh, I think there is a greater level of comfort between um, the four countries in terms of identifying it as a challenge. In fact, it was quite interesting and surprising somewhat to, to hear in various ways each, each country acknowledge that uh, they, they did discuss the challenge China posed uh, at the summit, uh, at the uh, leader summit. And as uh, Jake Sullivan put it later, 
uh, each one uh, basically said that no one had, none of them have illusions about uh, the, the China challenge. Uh, there are, I think there's a lot more convergence than there was in the past in terms of the broad uh, contours of the challenge. Um, I, there are some areas of difference, um, you know, the imminence of the threat, um, the exact approach to take. Um, I think this was particularly the case in the Trump administration where Australia, Japan, and India were not comfortable, for instance, with some of the rhetoric uh, India has a difference in terms of it would like, and I think Japan to some extent agrees on this, would like to see Russia as a balancer of China and not kind of a partner of it and would like to facilitate that. Whereas obviously the US uh, is not on that page, uh, at least for now. Um, I will say one kind of final thing on that, which is in terms of level of confident, uh, confidence, just in speaking from it, from the vantage point I see it, you've seen Indian confidence, for example, in the US, but also Australia and Japan increase over the course of um, this last year during the China crisis, where the US has assisted India with uh, intelligence sharing, fast tracking military equipment, rhetorical and diplomatic support. Um, and we haven't seen it. We saw a little bit of this in the 2017 crisis. Uh, but this is uh, this is the first kind of since the 60s that the, the two countries have cooperated so significantly uh, and Australia and Japan have made um, kind of uh, comments to, to support India as well. So I think the level of confidence uh, while recognizing that this is not an alliance and India at least has no secure, you know, cannot expect security obligation or obligate doesn't have security obligations to others and it doesn't have a commitment from any one of them. Uh, and yeah. we'll have to fight it on its own, uh, it, its own wars. Thank you. Pete, the final question to you. Yes, the final question of the evening, hopefully ending on a slightly more optimistic note. Uh, we have a question from Elizabeth Losos, who's curious as to whether the Quad and China could potentially come together and collaborate in a positive manner in terms of fighting climate change. Um, Mr. Carr, do you have any thoughts on that? Absolutely. The, uh, the Biden administration, in, in what, I, what I described earlier, is, is quite heroic, uh, altogether admirable, uh, and, and I'd say heroic leadership on climate, has acknowledged that there can't be a solution to the challenge we face of two degrees warming by 2050. Some projections put it terrifyingly at, at three degrees warming. Um, without collaboration with China, without cooperation from China. It's in China's interest to do it. And the, the, the Chinese five-year plan reduced, uh, released last month was disappointing in living up to the expectations of their own president's commitment last September at the General Assembly uh, that China would achieve net zero emissions by 2060. But, but I think there are dynamics in China working to improve their performance. And I tell you what, if this remarkable creature, the Chinese economy that has transformed this country um, in the last 40 years, commits itself as I suspect it will to action on climate, you will see things move. You will see things move. Um, the, the Chinese commitment to every front of the battle against climate is already impressive. Electronic vehicles, for example, um, and can become even more decisive. If we're going to get there by 2050, it'll be because China delivers and delivers in the wake of the uh, indisputably major commitments made by the US. But on this, I really, I really think the thing that would be would be shattering in its implications would be India signing up for what it, with OECD aid and assistance, could deliver on the switch to renewables. And to see India and China in peaceful competition to transfer, trans, trans, transfer to transform their economies, uh, with, with accepting the goals of sustainability would be the thing that makes the, the, the difference for the planet. Thank you very much. 
A last word to you, Natsuko? Or? I guess just um, a yeah. brief um, a small things to add. So uh, the, the working group of the climate change that the Quad just um, launched, that will deal with the um, some kind of technological development issues such as a climate change uh, alleviation or the adaptation issues. And uh, that technology would definitely, we're not to occupy uh, the, um, uh, that, that technology, but to contribute to you know the improving the global situation. And definitely China could be the best beneficiary of that. So uh, if you know, somehow in the in, in a kind of development cooperative uh, approaches, they we, we might the quad, uh, uh, the child can collaborate with the, um, uh, the China. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to thank our panelists and Brianna and Pete, and of course, our audience for a very constructive discussion. Thank you for your many questions. Thank the panelists in particular for their initial good and interesting remarks and for their contributions. Thank you to Natsuko Sukata, to Bob Carr, to Admiral uh, Dennis Blair and to Tanvil Madan. It's great to have you here. Thank you for joining us tonight. I would like to remind our audience that also our next event will be on the 26th of April, exceptionally at 1.30 p.m. US East Coast time. And that is the former German Vice Chancellor and Foreign Minister, Sigmar Gabriel. He will join us on the 26th of April to talk about a, a world in turmoil and tell us hopefully solutions of how to overcome that turmoil so that we can in, uh, avoid a military conflict in the future. Thank you again, everyone. Great to see you and uh, keep in touch, please. Bye-bye.